next topic we're looking at is actually an interesting topic and something that you can relate back to real life. It's called visual perception principles. And I'm going to try to go through it quickly so you guys can go ahead for your offline session. But um, visual perception principles is basically the way that our eyes view things in the environment and the particular principles or these particular concepts behind why certain things in our environment are viewed in a certain way. Okay, it's kind of connected to this concept of um, visual kind of like perception and how we make sense of our world, okay? And why certain things, why we view certain things in a particular way. So visual perception principles, again, the more fancy definition would be that rules that we apply to visual information, they help us to make sense and organize that visual information in a meaningful way. And so the three types of visual perception principles are gestalt principles, depth cues, and perceptual constancies. Okay, and this is more of like a visual based topic. So if you're able to look at the images on each slide and understand how that is portraying a particular way in which you judge that image, um, then that would basically be most of what this topic is about. So the first type of visual perception principle we're looking at is gestalt principles. And gestalt principles are basically the ways in which we organize a visual scene by grouping items together to perceive a whole complete form. So in your environment, and I'm gonna show you lots of examples of this, in your environment, a lot of the time, certain images or certain signs or certain um, logos, they might be not completely filled up. But you might notice that as the person starts drawing, drawing things up, like if you've ever played Pictionary, as a person starts drawing that particular um, animal, even before they finish drawing the entire animal, you might already guess what they're actually drawing. Okay, you might be like, oh, they, they drew two little ears and some whiskers, oh, that's a cat. Or they drew a little tail and a little tongue sticking out, that might be a dog. Okay, so that is basically what Just Up Principles are about. It's about how our brain will fill up certain bits of information or fill in gaps. Even if we're not shown a complete form of an image in front of us, our brain is very smart in the sense that it will guess what that image could be. Okay, so just our principles, there are four main types, figure, grand organization, closure, similarity, and proximity. So figure, grand organization is when we divide an image into a figure, which is basically like uh, the foreground and the background, which is the surrounding or the backing uh, image there. Okay, now figure, grand organization, if we're gonna connect this to real life, we would say that it's used in things like street signs. For example, in the street sign, the stop sign, you've got the red background, which is really a good contrast there. And you've got a white um, white caps kind of like, so you've got the word stop written in white in caps lock there. Okay, so you've got obviously, um, it's really easy for you to see. Now, if the background of this image was a really light color like yellow or even white, the word stop would either camouflage into the white background or it would not be clear. So from a distance, you wouldn't know that, okay, it's time to stop in a few minutes time. Okay, so basically that is what figure grand organization is. In this image here, um, some people will either perceive this image as a vase. If they only focus on the white stuff in the middle, they will think of this image as being a vase. However, if they only focus on the um, kind of the black silhouettes here, they will think of this as to the side of two people's faces. So that being the nose and then the lips and then the chin there. Okay, so depending on whether I look at the figure or the ground, I will actually visually perceive or make sense of this image in a different way. So figure ground organization is simply, you've got a background, which is called the ground. You've got a figure, which is usually the word or the thing in the middle. And that is basically, um, and depending on which one you look at, you might be perceiving that image in a particular way. Closure is when we mentally try to fill in an image that is incomplete to make it look whole. And we see this in many examples, okay? If you look at this image here, it's not even properly, it's not a properly constructed image, but most of you would be able to identify that this is an image of a dog, okay? Just looking at what it is, just making sense of what you've seen in the past, you would say that that most closely looks like a dog. Similarly, this most closely looks like an airplane. Similarly, this most closely looks like a giraffe, even though the image is not completely filled in. Even with logos of companies, like the Australian made logo, okay? Even though that's just a few lines, we can perceive that as being a kangaroo. We can perceive this as being two bottles because it's an ad for liquor land, okay? So basically that is what closure is. Closure is when an image is not completely filled up or not completely connected, we are still able to take a little guess as to what that image might be 
based on our previous experience of seeing similar images, based on what those lines look like the most. Okay, our brain is able to fill in the gaps. And it's called closure because our brain is trying to close the gaps in that image by itself. Alrighty, the next one is similarity. So similarity is basically your tendency or your habit to usually look at parts of an image that have similar features and to group them together. So if you look at this M&M's ad here um, in this picture, we're more likely to look at this image and start grouping together the yellow and the red and the blue M&M's, okay? Rather than just viewing it as a mix of different colors. When we think about real life, if you've gone on an excursion and you see another school, if all of the students in that other school are wearing blue uniforms and they all look the same, you're gonna assume that they're all from the same school, okay? Because they all have similar features, okay? They're all wearing the same uniform. So they look more like a single whole unit. Um, same thing when you're watching the Olympics or you're watching any like footy game or soccer game or whatever. Um, the main reason, the main way in which you identify which players are actually, who has the ball or which players, are, you know, um, you know, what's it called, moving towards the, um, what's it called, towards getting a goal, you're able to identify that from the uniform that they wear, okay? So that's basically what similarity is. When we see things that are similar in nature, we tend to group them together. And proximity is basically our ability to, um, when proximity is talking about how prox, um, how close things are together. And another word for close is proximity. So when we're talking about visual images or parts of a visual image, we are more likely to perceive um, things that are closer together as belonging together in one group, okay? So the closer the things are together, we're gonna say that they are one group. So if we just look at this example here um, with these little dots, uh, where's my color? Okay, um, with these little dots here, if we look at all these dots in the first image or part A of the image, you would notice that they're all very close together. And so we actually kind of like, our brain perceives them as being one big group. One big group. But if we were to take these and then kind of like not make them close together, or in other words, space them out. When I look at this now, my brain doesn't look at it as being one big group. My brain looks at part B now of this image as being three smaller groups. Okay, and this is what proximity is about. It's about basically um, dividing or increasing the distance between images and that when you do that, we are likely to perceive that image as no longer being one big group, but as being three smaller groups, okay? Just because we've got a little bit of gap now between each of those images there, okay? And that gap causes our brain to now perceive that those are three separate groups. So these are just things that we usually apply in our daily life. And this is a clip that you can watch on YouTube that's again connected to this idea. Now with depth perception, depth perception is our ability to accurately judge the distance of objects from us, okay? And in order to judge the distance of objects from us, we need to use something called depth cues. Now depth cues are basically ideas or hints that we get from our body um, or that we get from the environment that help us determine how far away something is from us. And depth cues are one of the reasons why um, we are able to judge, okay, how far is that car away from me? Can I cross the road? Is it safe for me to cross the road now? Even when you're driving, is it safe for me to turn onto the road now? Or is that car gonna come quickly and are we gonna crash, okay? All of those skills are because of your depth cues. Remember, depth is another word for distance. So in other words, depth perception is distance perception. Now, there are two main types of depth cues, binocular and monocular, okay? And we're going to explain what these two are. So, binocular depth cues require the use of both eyes because if you think about it, when you, whenever someone uses binoculars, they need to look into the binoculars with their two eyes. So, binocular depth cues use two eyes and basically what they do is they help us to understand depth and distance related information um, and understand how far something is away from how far something is in terms of its distance from us, okay? So the use of both eyes, okay? Binocular means both eyes. So um, convergence and retinal disparity, which we're gonna look at soon, are basically two examples of binocular depth cues. Now, monocular depth cues, on the other hand, require only the use of one eye. Mono meaning one, okay? Mono is means one. Ocular means eye, so one eye, okay? Depth cues that require the use of one eye. And um, accommodation we've already discussed in the earlier part of today. 
So accommodation, linear perspective, all of these things are what we call as um, pictorial cues and they're also monocular depth cues because even if I just use one eye, I'm still able to portray or demonstrate these visual abilities or visual perception principles there. Okay, but for binocular depth cues like retinal disparity and convergence, I do require the use of two eyes. Okay, it's not, it's not negotiable. I can't use one eye to show convergence or to show retinal disparity. So let's just quickly define what these are so that we can finish hopefully by 9.50. All right, so obviously convergence. Now you guys might have tried this yourself or you might have learned this in science maybe at some point. Convergence is when your eyes turn inwards, like this boy in this picture here, to focus on objects that are very close. So if something is to land on your nose or if someone is to take an image and bring it very close to your eye, just above the bridge of your nose, um, because there's no distance between you and that particular object or stimuli now, you have to turn your eyes inwards. Your eyes have to converge in order to focus on that object. Okay, and convergence is kind of connected to this idea of accommodation as well. Okay, but convergence is different because with convergence, both of your eyes need to turn inwards to focus on that object. Whereas with accommodation, it's something you can do with just one eye as well. So obviously, the closer the object is to your eyes, the greater the tension that you're going to feel in your eye muscles. So this boy will not be able to focus on this insect on his nose for very long because he's going to get a headache if he does, okay? It's really a lot of eye strain and a lot of eye tension that's building up there in order for him to view this object that is so very close to his eyes. So that's what convergence is. And we do require two eyes, obviously. Sorry. We do require two eyes for convergence because you need to... Um, turn both of your eyes inwards. You can't just turn one eye inwards, okay? That's why it's a binocular depth cue. Um, the other example of a binocular depth cue is retinal disparity. So retinal disparity is that depending on which, um, which location I, um, sorry, depending on which, um, which part of the retina an image falls onto, you might see a different side of that image, okay? So when I look at an image right in front of me, even if you put it right in front of me, when I look at it from my left eye, the image of that house that's cast on my retina will be a little bit different from the image of the house that's cast by my right retina or the right side of my eye. And this is because um, there is like, if you look at your eyes, your eyes are spaced apart, yeah? They're not very close to each other. And so in the same way, the retina in both of, in each of your eyes is also spaced out. So that means that when we do look at an object from a distance, um, we need to have both eyes in order to make that image a whole image, okay? If we only look at it from the right-hand side, we might miss out parts of the house that are on the left-hand side, like the left-hand frame of the house. If we only look at it from the left eye, we might miss out things that are um, from, you know, in the middle of the house or on the side of the house as well. So we need both eyes in order to see the full image and that's what retinal disparity is about, okay? Because our eyes and our retinas are spaced apart. So depending on if I only look at an image from one eye, I'm only going to see a certain angle of that image, okay? So we need both eyes to see the full image and to make sure that we are accounting for all angles and all sides of that image. Um, when we're talking about monocular depth cues, where only one eye can be used, we've already talked about accommodation. Accommodation is how your lens automatically adjusts to focus on an object. And obviously accommodation is influenced by the ciliary muscles, okay? The ciliary muscles of your eye will become smaller if you need to um, focus on that image a little bit more and if that image is too close to your eye. If the image is a little bit further away from your eye, um, it's going to be a little bit more relaxed and so it's going to expand, okay, because you don't have to focus on it as much. Okay, with accommodation, it's a monocular depth cue because you're only using one eye. So if I cover your left eye, you're still able to focus on an object that's a little bit far away from you or that it's, that's um, right in front of your um, field of vision, okay? You don't need both eyes to accommodate. Accommodate is just the process of focusing. Pictorial cues are basically used by artists. And so pictorial cues are also an example of monocular depth cues where only one eye can be used, okay? Pictorial cues are basically relating to pictures and art, um, art forms and paintings, okay? You see these in a lot of art forms and paintings. And so we're just gonna um, go through a few of them, not in too much depth, but just to give you an idea. They're really short slides. You just gotta mainly look at the pictures. So the first type of pictorial cue, which is a monocular depth cue, is linear perspective. Linear perspective suggests that when you've got two parallel lines running, 
um, the further and further those two parallel lines kind of go into the distance, it looks like they are going to meet at some point. So I'll just quickly draw over this to show you what I mean. I need colour red. Okay, so if you've got these two parallel lines of grass, okay, they look like they're parallel, but as they move further, sorry, as they move further and further into the distance, at some point they look like they might meet. Okay, same with this little bridge here. These two parallel lines, they're moving in parallel, but as they move further and further, I'm really bad at this, as they move further and further into the distance, somewhere about there, there they look like they might meet together or that they might join. Okay, and that's what linear perspective is. Linear coming from the word line, okay? Talking about the two parallel lines, um, looking like they're gonna meet at some point. Okay, interposition. So interposition is when you put one object in front of another object, um, and it looks like the object that is being covered is actually further away from the object that's hiding it. So what that means is that in this image here with the sheep, because this big fat sheep is right in front, whoopsie, because this big fat sheep is right in front, it looks like we focus our lens more on this sheep and it looks like this sheep is further away, okay? Even though both of these sheep might be standing at exactly the same point in the farm or at exactly the same distance away from my eye, okay? But it's just a kind of mind trick that your eye does on you, that you feel like this sheep is further away from you or it's more distant. Um, same thing with the image here. Because the chocolate muffin is in front of the cup of coffee, the chocolate muffin looks like it's closer to me, but the coffee looks like it is further away from me. Even if it's just a little bit further away, because the cake is in front, it kind of oversteps or overtakes, and it looks like the cake is closer to my um, group or it's closer to my field of vision there. Okay, um, the next one that we're looking at is... Texture gradient, so obviously um, texture gradient suggests that if I'm looking at an image like this, um, you know, this drought stricken land or this um, pond of lily pads, the images that are in the front, oops, sorry, the images that are in the front look a lot more clearer and I can make out the texture of those images a lot better. Okay, I can really see the texture here a lot better. It's a lot more clearer, it's a lot more detailed. But as we move further and further into the image or further away from the image, I won't be able to judge the texture of the rocks in this area here, okay? It's not clear anymore. So it's unclear, okay, it's unclear. So the gradual decrease in detail relating to the texture of an image as it gets further and further away from us is what we call as texture gradient. Same thing with the lily pads in the pond here. The lily pads that are right in the foreground of the image or right in front of me over here, are much clearer and I can judge their detail a lot better and their texture, but the ones at the back here are further away from my field of vision and their texture becomes a little bit more unclear or blurred. Okay, so that's basically what we call as texture gradient, the texture becoming a little bit more blurred the further into the image that it goes. Okay, almost done. Relative size, so you would have seen a lot of people taking these pictures at the, you know, the Leaning Tower of Pisa or whatever, or you know Eiffel Tower, where they stand in front of the Eiffel Tower pretending to carry it. And so because the Eiffel Tower is um, really further away, I'm sorry, not Eiffel Tower, because the Leaning Tower of Pisa is really further away in this image, it looks like the lady is a big giant and she's carrying this, um, this Leaning Tower of Pisa, even though we know in real life, the Leaning Tower of Pisa is huge and this lady is probably a tiny person. Um, so because it's further away from us, it looks smaller, okay? And this is why these kinds of photos that people take work, because the further away an image from us um, is from us, the smaller will be its relative size with reference to the person that's standing in front of us. The lady looks much bigger here compared to the um, image there. Okay, this is just showing you that if you were to take this guy here, who looks very small, capture that scale and pull him right next to the guy in front, this would be the actual size of the guy, okay? Because he's further into the distance, he looks a lot smaller, okay? So the relative size of this guy in this image looks much smaller compared to the guy sitting in front, okay? If you were gonna um, make it look like this um, scale is actual size, you bring him to the front, he's actually that size, so he's like really tiny. Okay, so relative size is just about when you move images to the back or further away from you, they look a lot smaller. Okay, that's why when you see your friend um, in the corridor on the opposite end of the corridor, they look really, really small, but as they move closer and closer to you, 
um, you can start to see them more clearly and they get to normal size. And the last thing that we're looking at is height in the visual field. So height in the visual field is basically talking about the fact that objects that are located closer to the horizon are perceived as being more distant than objects located further away from the horizon. So the horizon is basically a fancy way of saying where the sun would rise, okay? If you were to take any image and you were to draw an imaginary sunrise on those images, that would be the horizon, okay? The horizon is basically where the sun would rise. In the first image, it would be something like maybe that. In this image, if we were gonna draw a horizon in this image, you'll probably be right at the back as well. Okay, in this image, the horizon would be somewhere here. Okay, now images that are closer to the horizon, so in this case, these trees here are perceived as being more distant. Okay, when we look at this image, we know that these trees here or the little bit of the fence here is much distant away from us compared to the little logs and little lavender plants at the front. If we look at the second image of the kangaroos, this kangaroo that's lying down here is closer to the horizon. So it looks like it's further away from us compared to the kangaroo that's right in the front here in the foreground. In the last image, these little ducks look very close to us because they're further away from the horizon. But this house that's right at the back that's very close to the horizon is looking like it's quite far or distant from us. Okay, and this is basically um, used by artists to make, um, to show um, this um, idea of distance in images, okay? Um, and so artists will use all these different pictorial cues related to art, related to pictures, to form things like distance, to show that this object is further away from another object, etc., etc. All right, so that's basically our visual perception principles. And there's some more clips. Um, that's another clip that you can watch connected to the, that idea. Okay, we're gonna stop here for today. So we have gone six minutes over time, um, but now I can probably confidently say that yes, we will be able to have a proper revision session in our one period next week. Okay, so I know it's a lot of content. I'm gonna stop the recording here.